what I wanted to do was uh, share some very brief uh, campaign stories with you. So there are seven campaigns, um, a number of which I've had some involvement with or am involved in. And to try and point to a principle connected to each one of those that I think can be informative in terms of thinking about campaigning and then also have one or two tools associated with those principles that can help kind of campaign planning and execution. Um, so I should say that in the interest of sort of being transparent in my own campaigning story, I certainly don't regard myself as a, a master, which was kind of how Ed framed this as a master class of campaigning. But, sizzling. Yeah, sizzling master class. <laughs> anyway, well, it might be sizzling, but um, I'm much more kind of, of a practitioner, and everything that I'm telling you, I've kind of nicked from other places, and um, a lot of it's also from um, a guy that I've met a long time ago and still work with from time to time, Chris Rose, who some of you may know, who's like kind of to my mind, the most incisive campaign brain that I've encountered. So if you're not familiar with his work, Google campaign strategy and you'll find him at his website. And that's kind of like campaigning advanced, if you like. Anyway, right, so without further nonsense, um, I got into campaigning back in 2002, kind of accidentally, actually, when I was working with WF UK. And, um, there was a campaign there, an opportunity to run a campaign on hazardous chemicals, which was a bit controversial and kind of viewed with suspicion by people in the organisation um, because it was going after a piece of European legislation that if we won it, would then result in a degree of animal testing and that's going to be problematic for WWF because even though WWF is not an animal welfare organisation, a lot of its supporters think it is. So it was kind of like creating all sorts of half channels for the fundraisers. And all the big sort of season campaigners in WF UK were saying, oh, we'll touch that with a barge pole. So I was like, well, I'll have a go. And, um, and I kind of thought, well, how difficult can it be to campaign? And I think probably about 12, 13 years later, I'm still finding it difficult to campaign. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And I'll talk a bit more about that campaign in a minute. Um, so the first one I wanted to offer was this sort of campaign that's very much at the beginning. So some of you, if you live in Bristol, will know, or perhaps even those of you who don't live in Bristol, will know that Bristol won the European Green Capital Award for 2015. So there's now a kind of live debate about, OK, what are we going to do? Um, it's a great opportunity, whatever you think of the EU award itself, to try and kind of sell the sizzle about green and environment in Bristol and redefine the narrative about Bristol as a city. And I guess kind of alluding to what Ed was saying about London and the Olympics in the UK yesterday, what's the story that we can tell about Bristol? So, the, you know, given that we're right at the beginning, the, the principle that I wanted to kind of highlight in this example was start from your objective and work backwards. So it's kind of really obvious, but very often we ignore that in campaign. Planning. We start with the kind of got this fantastic idea for a digital game, or let's get on Facebook, or you know, let's go and do something wacky in terms of a campaign activity, and then kind of you do it, and you spend loads of money on developing it, and you think, well, why are we doing this? And what's it, who's it for, and how, what's it going to achieve? So very important to start with that endpoint in mind and work backwards from there, sort of like kind of reverse dominoes, if you like. Um, so a good tool, the ambition box. This is for Chris. Um, you can think about an objective in sort of three dimensions. Um, one in terms of sort of size, so how much of the overall problem does it represent? The second one, how hard is it to achieve? And then possibly the most important one, significance. So that's the kind of three-dimensional bit about if you win, how much of the kind of overall problem do you then end up shaping as a consequence? So some of this, sorry, this list is probably a bit small for those of you sitting at the back, but. Is it significance across a political? It doesn't have significance across a political system, or does it set a legal precedent, or does it introduce new technology? Those kinds of things. So it's kind of saying, can you choose a strategic objective that will then have a strategic effect? So in and of itself, the meeting that objective doesn't give you everything you want, but it starts the dominoes. Kind of thing. So I'm trying to illustrate that a bit for Bristol. So a low-hanging fruit, if you want, if you like, might be. Let's do business as usual stuff. Let's reduce carbon emissions, etc. Uh, kind of already operational stuff that's going on within the city. So, on that scale of significance, that's kind of like an organisational approach, which would be sort of business as usual and iterative, if you like. You go to the back of the box, you get into kind of harder things to do. If you go upwards, you get into kind of big, hard enough things to crack. So that becomes a lot more significant. So. 
going after Bristol as a solar city would be a bit more ambitious, but not kind of probably not that difficult to achieve actually. In terms, we have a lot about marketing and sort of saying we've got a lot of community things already. How can we package that in a way and tell a new story about Bristol? Well, it's community energy and, and sort of package it on a system-wide basis. But if you wanted to say, well, let's kind of make Bristol's footprint zero across all kind of environmental parameters, then that's a lot harder to do. It certainly isn't going to happen by 2015, but you might set it as a longer-term goal that 2015 could be a, a launching pad to work. <coughs> so, ambition box. Great fun to be had uh, with it. Second one, um, not involved in this, but Varinga is a relatively recent campaign from WFUK saying don't explore for oil in Varunga World Heritage Park. And interesting to me, I think, having worked at WF for a very long time, in as much as it's very, very clear, it says, draw the line, do not do this. And that's quite rare, actually, for WWF that likes to kind of engage in dialogue and kind of break the consensus. Things. But I think vital, actually, in terms of running a clear campaign. So uh, the principle here is campaign against the unacceptable. So I think we call it a block, but the 5% rule will be a tool to use. So that's saying that if you've got a kind of problem map of everything, your big issue about whatever it is you're working on, there's 101 different things you'd like to sort out. Choose the one thing that's most unacceptable to the most number of people. So the kind of 5% of the problem that's unacceptable to 95% of the public, that's the thing to go after. That's the thing that could be strategic in terms of leveraging change on the rest of the problem. Third one. Um, so I had quite a lot of involvement in, in fracking campaigning when I was running the campaign scene the co-op a couple of years now. Um, we commissioned a report on shale gas and the impact of that from a climate perspective from the Tinder Centre. And we also premiered Gasland, which is an award-winning documentary, some of you probably heard of it, if not seen it. Uh, premiered that in the UK and then toured it round a number of different communities um, where fracking was kind of potentially coming down the track. It's sort of saying, look, you know, be aware. And we invited lots of other sort of society groups along, local councils, et cetera, et cetera, to come on, let's have a, and did a world cafe event. So showed the film and then had a big debate about it. They went down very successfully. And then, so two years later, so now you've got big environmental organizations also campaigning for shell gas and fracking, and also local community groups getting very excited about it. And I'm not suggesting that what the co-op did two years ago is now because you know, it's delivered all of this, but it certainly contributed to sort of lighting that match at a local level, if you like. Um, and the point here is about identifying conflict. Now, I don't mean when you campaign you've got to go out and try and cause a fight, <laughs> but what I mean is if you run a successful campaign where you've got a, you know, you've got the, the kind of the genesis of a campaign to create, it, it will be because you're in conflict, in conflict with something or somebody. And that's probably going to be the most sort of media worthy opportunity. So you need to kind of look for that. Where is that point of conflict? And then make it visible through events. Um, and the, yeah, the doing test. So asking every day, what, what's your campaign doing? You know, it's like, I'm a campaigner. What are you campaigning on? I'm campaigning on fish. What are you doing? Well, you know, we're, we're kind of thinking about it a lot and we're talking about it a lot and we're trying to kind of think our way to a solution. Well, that's no good, obviously. You've got to get out there. You've got to write letters. You've got to talk to MPs. You've got to do whatever it takes. Climb the shard. Uh, do an opinion poll. Uh, what, what sorts of other things? I don't know. Take, take, take your grandma to Brussels to meet your MPs. We'll see how that comes into play later. Um, all of those kinds of things. So asking yourself every day, what's campaign doing? And just on the fracking thing, well, I couldn't resist putting this in. It's really like, ingenious, I think, bit of campaigning for Greenpeace called Wrong Move. It's obviously a play on Right Move UK, the house move thing. You type in your postcode and it tells you whether or not you might be in an area where fracking and shell gas exploration could happen. The reason they're doing this is that the Greenpeace lawyers uh, worked out that companies can't go looking for gas unless they've got your, your permission to sort of drill up your land. So they're kind of hoping that by through some sort of crowdsourcing thing, if everybody does this and signs up and says, I don't want it, that they kind of get enough of a spread across the UK that it becomes legally problematic for gas companies to do exploration. 
I think there's some debate about whether that's true, but ingenious nevertheless. Next one. Uh, yeah, so this was the first campaign I got involved in, the chemicals campaign at, at WF UK. And what we did was we um, went around the UK with an ambulance and did events in different towns and took people's blood and went looking for hazardous chemicals, persistent hazardous chemicals in people's bodies. So it was a kind of exploration, if you like, um, to create a local event, invite the mayor, invite the local D radio DJs to come along, partnered up with the co-op and the WI, so we had a lot of local WI members come along and get their blood tested. And there was a sort of model here, which is the sort of point I guess I'm building up to, which is it was about creating a story and the campaign model here was survey, discover, and so survey taking people's blood and looking for stuff, discovering what was in it, and then taking action, which was where the ground arts came in, which was about taking the WI to the European Parliament. And on the way over on the Eurostar, we asked them to we said bring a bring a picture of your grandchildren with you. And then we got them to do posters on the way over on the Eurostar saying, what does this issue mean to you? So they thought, you can't see it in the picture, but that's what those orange poster things are. They all say things like, don't poison my grandson's future and stuff like that. So it's a very kind of personal uh, message and story. And obviously, all of these people have been on this journey of getting the blood tested and so on. So, sorry, that's a rather long winded. But that's about creating a visual story. So everything we've been talking about for the last couple of days. And the simple test there is, can you take a photograph of what your campaign is doing? Or can you storyboard it backwards from the objective? How do you get there? What are the, what's the process? What does it look like? And if you can't do that, then you need to rethink, because you haven't got a campaign. If you can't show it happening and unfolding. You know, a good campaign needs to be like a drama. So it's kind of like, it has to have meaning and poignance for people. But when you start on the journey, kind of like the ending is unknown, so what's going to happen? That's the way to involve people, not kind of giving them the whole thing right at the start. Next one. Uh, nothing to do with me. Um, <coughs> carbon dioxide. <coughs> I kind of read about this recently and I thought, that's a good one. Um, fossil free started in the US about a year ago and has just come to Europe and the UK. And in the UK it's focused very much on UK universities and colleges and institutional investment in fossil fuel energy companies. And I think the, the, the report from um, uh, People and Planet says that there's five billion that UK universities got invested in fossil fuel energy companies. Um, so the ask is very clear. It's, it's saying divest this money. Now, that, it's not going to bankrupt the fossil fuel industry, but it sends quite a strong political statement. So it's kind of on the road towards political bankruptcy, if you like. And um, what's fascinating about this is this, this kind of um, model of divestment is, is you know, a tried and tested campaigning route that has been used to tackle apartheid and tobacco and arms in the past and has been very effective. And this one is growing faster than any of those campaigns did in the past. Um, so the principle here, um, is about matching the scale of your solution that you're offering to the size of the problem. So climate change is a massive problem, and very often people feel like, they are, what can I do as a person or as an individual to try and solve this thing? So for me, at least anyway, seeing that divestment proposition, I kind of thought, well, that's kind of quite good, because it feels like it can actually have traction and do something. Um, and if there's enough people making that noise and that political move, it should work. It's a sort of universally applicable ask of asking people to divest. And energy companies, you know, what they do is they go after the highest return with the lowest risk. So at the moment, renewables don't present that. Back in the day when BP was rebranding itself as Beyond Petroleum and sort of saying we're going to go after renewables, in behind the scenes discussions, they were talking to environmentalists and saying they were quite serious about this and were expecting government to put in place tax and fiscal incentives to make that happen. It didn't happen, and that's why the renewables never really took off. That's, that's kind of why, why the big energy companies uh, have pulled out of development. Where am I going with that? Re reversibility test. So it, this is another way of looking at this, the problem solution thing. If you say, well, if we get the solution that we're offering, where does that leave us in the context of the problem? 
So that's just a simple way of checking whether you, what you're kind of saying is the way forward for your supporters, or your activists, is actually going to deliver it. I've cheated. There's two here on number six. So this is about um, it's a while back, um, 2006, Greenpeace, as part of their electronic waste campaign, did this thing called Green White Apple. It was ingenious at the time because it invited Apple fans to become the campaigners. Um, and in a very sort of cheeky way, I'll just read you what Greenpeace say about it. He said, in considering how we might win improved policies from Apple, we knew one thing for certain, Apple might tune out Greenpeace, but they would never tune out their customers. Apple's famously loyal fan base was the one force on the planet that was guaranteed to get the attention of Apple's CEO, Steve Jobs. So we decided this was to be a very different Greenpeace campaign, one in which we'd turn over the reins to Apple's customers. We'd, we would stand in the shoes of Apple fans, and we'd speak as fellow believers, and we'd try to channel ways of Apple love corporate headquarters. So this is in time, this is like pre-iPhone, when Apple was kind of big, but still quite niche, and very much kind of graphic design users and that sort of alternative trendy kind of laptop type thing to have. So they got all of those fans to do it. And the principle for me here was very, very simple, kind of like number one, really, start from where your audience is. Um, uh, so in this case, starting with Apple fans. And a useful tool, uh, again, this one's from Chris Rose, Camp Cat, he calls it. Um, so that's an acronym, obviously context, audience, messenger, program, channel, action, trigger. So the program's the only internal one. So that's about the whole kind of issue map of what you're campaigning on, which actually no one else apart from you and a couple of other people in the organization <coughs> to know about. The rest is what's really, really important. So in this context, it wasn't the Greenpeace that was the messenger delivering the thing. It was the Apple fans and you know, targeting Steve Jobs and so on. This was part of the app. They got people to take pictures of themselves hugging their app. Post, posted a lot of them on Flickr, so it's like, you know, I love my Apple, but I wish it came in green. Um, so that's, for me anyway, a very useful and simple tool to use when thinking about constructing propositions. The other one, which I wanted to bring in, because it's a um, Futera invention, the swishing, which they came up with, I think, seven or eight years ago, which is about trying to make swapping clothes kind of trendy and exciting. Who knows about swishing? Great. Well, there you go. So it's become really, um, you bet ubiquitous and common and so it's kind of like saying here's, here's a way of doing retail therapy if you like but without going out and spending money and bankrupting yourself and all the stress of shopping you can go around to your mate's house and have a nice time um, so Ed's favourite phrase sell the sizzle so that's the principle if you like so again related to where's your audience that you're trying to get to and um, a very useful tool I guess that some of you will already know um, about determining how to approach your audience. Um, again, Futero's language about brick, gold, and green wedges. So this is values-based segmentation of the public at its simplest. And it's saying that there are kind of three different types of people at a very basic level that make up the public. And you can think about them in terms of framing your campaign ask, if you like. So um, we generally would be the green wedge, because we kind of think green stuff and environmental things are really important. If you construct your campaign with that thinking cap on, you might lose the brick wedge and the gold wedge altogether, so people that don't think like us. So here's a way of thinking about those wedges. In the fictional town of Seaton, there are dolphins that visit, and the brick wedge like the dolphins because Seaton wouldn't be Seaton without dolphins returning every year. Gold wedge like the dolphins coming to Seaton because they've moved there quite recently from London. They've got a nice house by the sea, and in fact, the dolphins coming means that their house price is even more than it would be if the dolphins weren't there. And the green wedge like the dolphins coming to Seaton because they think they might be a dolphin themselves. So that's a kind of slightly glib way of talking about the wedges, but um, a useful tool nevertheless. Um, and there is a big debate about values, which I'm sure some of you will be aware of, kind of common cause versus values modes. Anyway, you can talk about that later if you want. Last one then, fish. Notoriously difficult subject to campaign on, one that I've spent quite a lot of time trying to campaign around, um, sometimes more successfully than others. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this. Uh, Hughes Fish Fight, which I haven't, wasn't involved with, but was successful, relatively speaking, in as much as um, you know, 
it got people focused on on the issue and got something to happen at the European level. Why? <coughs> um, well, fishermen and public could agree that waste and fish in the form of discards, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with that issue, was a bad idea, so wasting the you know, value of the fish was a good thing. And people in this instance were able to identify with the fishermen, in other words, with people, rather than having to kind of cross that horrible gap, like how do you do a fish campaign and get people to worry about fish? as opposed to the media, which is always focused on the, on the hardship and the kind of heroic role of the fishing. Um, and also, very important from a, from a story perspective, kind of made for a TV programme, so right from the start, we've got to make it simple, we've got to make it clear, so there's lots of lessons in there about how to construct a story if you look at how TV works, which I think other people have talked about already uh, in, the, in the last couple of days. And a big hinterland to this, so lots of campaigning already by lots of organisations, not least the end of the line documentary and Charles Clover's work in his book, which again, I guess most of you will know about. So kind of a, a situation ripe for somebody to come in and say, look, this is the 5% of the problem that's really bad and that we need to tackle, in this case, discards. And I think, okay, so the principle here, a very na narrow focus, very simple. So saying what you mean and keeping it simple, tools for that, how do you explain it to your grandmasters, you know, it's an elevated pitch thing. Uh, problem, solution, benefit, proposition, so in its simplest form, what's the problem, what's the solution, what's the benefit if you put that solution in place. You need to be able to kind of articulate that succinctly in about 60 seconds, you can't do that, practice it, or work it out, and then that's where three stories comes in, which is this idea of saying, you know, there probably are three main stories for every campaign. There's a popular story, a professional story, and a political story. And separating those can be very helpful. So if you work in an organisation and you have communicators, policy people, and public affairs, political people around the table all kind of debating, like, well, what's, what are we going to say? What's our key message? It's helpful to split them out in threes and say, OK, the popular story is what we tell our supporters that's all you will broadcast publicly. And that's the one that needs to be very, very simple. The professional story is all the stuff about, like, what's the policy, what's the kind of point five, you know, what's the mesh size we need to have in place to prevent baby cod being caught, that kind of stuff, which you don't want to talk to the public about at all. You might want to talk to trade press about it, but that's probably about it. And the political story will be the one that you then talk to politicians about when you meet them, or just other decision makers. And that's really about the benefit for them probably isn't about the issue at all. It's like, well, okay, if you do this, what, what, what's, the, what's the kind of credit politically that you could achieve in doing that? So being able to understand that and offer that to proposition to decision makers are important. Also, it's very cathartic, because if you have that conversation, you get three stories mapped out. It avoids that kind of horrible conflict within an organisation where different people from different disciplines in the organisation are trying to cram everything into one narrative. And finally, then, reality check. So, um, I had to get a reference to the Magnificent Seven Inns. So, it was this, which is that right at the end, if you know the story, um, the Magnificent Seven, only three of them remain alive at the end, but they save this Mexican, Mexican village from bandits, and the, and the main bandit gets killed. Um, and the elders thanking the remaining three gunmen before they leave. And he bids them farewell and he says, he says, you're like the wind blowing over the land and passing on, vaya con Dios. And as they leave, Chris, who's the gunman played by Yul Brynner, so he says, the old man was right and only the farmers won. We lost, we always lose. So don't want to be too pessimistic, but very often campaigning can be very difficult and you very often lose or you don't get what you want. So it's very important to sort of ask, can you get the result you want another way? You don't always have to campaign. Um, and probably campaigning should be the last uh, resort. Uh, yeah, but it's very important to keep campaigning because of things like the gang of law and what's at stake with the whole thing around the Arctic. Firstly, I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but yeah, that's it. Great. I'm going to stop. Thank you, Justin. You're that welcome. Was great.